Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Let's turn to 136. 136, the first Noel, the only Christmas song that I know of with six verses to it. So we'll see how many we sing. I'll try to lead you through it. But 136, the first Noel. Remember, Noel means news. So it's talking about the first official presentation of the gospel, if you will, the fact that Jesus came. 136. The first Noel, the angel did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay, in fields where they lay keeping their sheep. Tis night that was so deep, Noel, Noel. Thank you for Christ coming for us, and we pray that he would get the glory through all that's said and done today as we bring forth your word and work as best we can to point folks to Christ. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn, if you would, please, to 128. It came upon a midnight clear. All four verses, 128, it came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old. It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old, with angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. Gracious King, 
The world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing. Still through the cloven skies they come with peaceful wings unfurled. And still their heavenly music floats for all the weary world. Above its sad and lowly plains they bend on hovering wing, and ever o'er its babel sounds the blessed angels sing. And ye beneath life's crushing load whose forms are bending long, who toil along the climbing way with painful steps and slow. Look now for glad and golden hours come swiftly on the wing. Oh, rest beside the weary road and hear the angels sing. For though the days are hastening on by prophets seen of old, when with the ever-circling years shall come the time foretold, when the new heaven and earth shall own the Prince of Peace, the King, and the whole world send back the song which now the angels sing. Amen. Okay, take your bulletins, if you would please. We'll look at a few things. Okay, back to the bulletin. Had to give the kids some instruction a second. We still have food if you need some, or if you know of someone who needs some, please let us know. We have our cookie exchange. So about everyone, everyone here brought cookies, and so everyone here gets cookies, and we know you'll, uh, you'll enjoy those from what I've seen of the cookies so far, so we appreciate you partaking in that. And... Oh, we're thankful for it. You have a write-up on your other side of your page on the fact that Jesus Christ is God. You say, well, of course he is God. Well, the world, you, you would not believe, folks. The world that calls themselves Christian do not believe this fact that Jesus Christ is God made flesh. And you say, well, we've gone a long, long way. yes a long, long way away from the Bible, and that is for sure. So, you have a little right up there, Philippians 2, 5 through 8, Jesus Christ is God. We hope that will encourage you. And, the, and it's got the three big reasons. If you ever need anything, you talk to someone who doesn't know or doesn't even believe Jesus is God. You've got three big reasons of why he is. He did the works of God, he accepted the worship of God, and he claimed equality with God. And the scholars today will say, well, no, he didn't. Yes, he did. If you read your Bible, we see very clearly that he did claim equality with God. And so that is one of the basic tenets of our faith. And that's why we're here today to study the word because the living word is God made flesh. You have your reading through John on the back of the bulletin. You also have some quotes from Mr. Spurgeon and Mr. Mueller on what they have to give. And so we trust that will encourage you. Well, Phoebe is going to play for you number what? 148. 148 which is O Holy Night, and we trust that'll be an encouragement to you. 148, which is O Holy Night.
Thank you, Phoebe. It was 148, O oh, Holy Night. Okay. Let's look at John chapter 1, if you would please. We'll look at this over the next couple weeks. Tis the Christmas season, and the best thing we can do during the Christmas season is consider Christ. Now, we should consider Christ all the time, right? But especially so during this time. You know, we talk about, throughout the last year, we've talked about, are you thankful that you're a child of God? And if you're thankful you're a child of God, are you thankful for the Word of God? As we are in the Word of God, we draw close to the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We talk about being thankful for the Spirit of God that helps us to bear forth the fruit of the Spirit. So, trust that our Bible studying has been good throughout the week and God has been speaking to us. And if it's not been very good, get right back on the horse this week and don't let, especially Christmas, we get out of our routines, right? We... Stop the things we are normally doing, and it's so easy to get busy with other things. We have to make sure we keep our Bible studies up. That is what hurts us. People get angry, depressed, you know, the whole routine, angry, depressed, fearful, and whatnot, doubtful. Why? Because we're not reading our Bibles, studying to apply it most often, most often. And if I've said it once, I've said it many, many times. And why do I say it many, many times? Because it's, it's the truth. It's the truth. So John chapter 1, we're going to look at the topic in verse number 14 that says the word was made flesh. The word was made flesh. You got right up in your bulletin. The word was made flesh, right? Jesus Christ is God. He is not a God. He is not part of some divine council like some heretics put forth. He's not one of a pantheon of gods like the Greeks and Romans believed. He is the God. He is very God, as some preachers have said. He is equal to God, as the Bible says. He is God made flesh. He is the Son of and yet no less than the Father. You say, well, he lessened himself. Yet he, yes, he did so of necessity. He did so willingly. But he did not stop being God. Okay? You say, I can't understand that. I can't either. It doesn't change the facts, though. We do not base our faith based upon what we understand because we can't understand everything about God. We can't understand why he would love us to die for wretched sinners like us so that we could be saved, we can't understand. We can't base our faith off what we understand. We simply have to believe what the Word says. And so John chapter 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning. And we got the Avengers going off. <laughs> Andrea, go get that. <laughs> Isn't that just like the devil? Let's enjoy the theme song for a second. Is that Mr. Likely? Yeah. Do you want to put my phone on vibrate, please? We'll bring it up here and I'll take care of it. It's been my week. This is very simply, simply dealt with. It's called silent mode. No, it's fine. It's not going to go off again. All right. All right. Back to this. We all make mistakes, right? Mine was not putting my phone on vibrate. <laughs> okay. Getting back to John chapter 1. Apparently there's something that um, the devil doesn't want us to hear today. So, just... Uh, Make sure we focus especially. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. 
In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, talking about John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him, talking about the light, might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came, still talking about the light and the word. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh. If you don't have that underlined in your Bible, I hope you will. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Father, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts today, that you'd help us to cling to Christ, to love him more and more, to cast away our wretched selves and the lust of our flesh and line up with God's will as we see in God's word. Help us, we pray. We cannot do these things without your help. We need your grace about our lives. We need you, especially at this time, this time of year. Father, help us to shine the light of Christ as he is our light. And may others see it in us. May they not see darkness. May they see Christ. And we'll thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to look at the first five verses, I believe, today. As we consider the topic, the word was made flesh. The word was made flesh. That's what Luke chapter 2 which we consider and think to be the Christmas story, right? Talks about the word was made flesh. That's what Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8 is talking about. The word was made flesh. And so someone said, I believe it was J.C. Ryle, that these words are so important, verse number 1 through 5. And reveal so much about our faith that they ought to be written in gold on the walls of every church. That's how important they are to us. We ought to read them, meditate upon what they mean, memorize them as we read them repetitiously, and consider how good God is to send his son to die for us. You see, if a single word out of this passage were changed, that's why when we read the King James, we believe it's the best translation for English-speaking people. Other translations have changed the words to this passage. Some have changed it so much that they choose to translate it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Making Jesus Christ just to be some demigod. Something less than God. You see the difference? You see how important it is that we take the word to heart. Because people are trying to corrupt the word, and they are. And we know that they're, they're motivated by their flesh. The main motivation for all these translations out today, all these versions, is not to get the word of God into your hands and mine. It's money. It's money. I could prove that. In various ways. Most popular book of all time, right? Throughout the ages. Think of how much money that Thomas Nelson and Crossway and all those various Bible publishers had made off God's name. They don't make much money off the King James because there's no copyright to it. There's no copyright. And so, and so, we have to understand that people motivated by their flesh and the devil, too, 
they want to change God's word. But it means what it says. So we see, first off, as we look at the first, the first point, is Jesus Christ the word? We're going to look at Jesus Christ the light and some other things later on. But Jesus Christ the word, verse 1 through 5. The first under that being the word was in the beginning. This is so important, the eternality of God. The eternality of the word who is Jesus Christ. The fact that he is very God. In the beginning is synonymous with Genesis 1.1. Some people like to put this passage of Scripture even before Genesis 1-1 as it refers previous to that passage. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was not just with God, but He was God. And we're going to look at that here presently. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens, and the earth. We talked about the fact that the word Elohim, you can't see it in the Hebrew. You can if you use something like Blue Layer Bible or Strong's Concordance or whatnot. But you look at the word Elohim, it's a plural word. There is a singular and a dual to the Hebrew language. There is also a suffix that means three or more, and that is the im, the I am, Elohim, three or more, denoting, we believe, the Trinity, God, the Son, Father, Spirit, all there at creation. And when creation came about, the Bible tells us here the word already existed. He was already there, his eternality. First Peter 1, verse 23. We're doing a little bit of Christology today and I believe it very appropriate for Christmas. 1 Peter 1, verse 23. The Bible says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. See, the living word of God and the written word of God are synonymous. They are the same. Without the living word of God, we would not have the written word of God. It says, the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Forever means forever and ever. We know that God himself, we believe he is eternal. He had no beginning. He had no ending. He lives outside of time. When he made the earth, he was already there. When the angels came to be, he was already there. When heaven was created, whenever in the world that was, he was already there. And he will never cease to be. We don't have to worry about our God ever leaving us, our God ever dying, our God ever becoming disgusted with us and casting us away. He is always there and always will be. We don't have to worry about him decaying. We live in an ever-present state of decay. That's what we're used to. Our bodies decay, this world decays, everything. That's what we're used to. God does not decay. He does not become senile. He does not develop cancer. He does not develop dementia. He does not change. He is as strong, as virile, if you will, as he was thousands of years ago. His strength has not diminished. His wisdom has not changed. He is God. And so we see the word, he was with God. Two distinct persons, right? The Father and the Son. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He's his own separate person, yet remaining one as God. Can we understand the Trinity? No, not fully. Not fully. But we understand he is the three in one. Without being a triunity, without being a, a, a tribunal, three gods in one council. The Bible never puts that forth. It's just God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And Jesus is the Son. As the Son, the Bible says that he is our advocate, right? He is our advocate, while the Father is the judge. 1 John 2, 1 through 2, which we've looked at before. Talks about Jesus being our defense attorney, as our Redeemer, he goes before the Father, the judge, and says, hey, these people are mine. Satan accuses, hey, these people are mine. 
First John 2, verse 1, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate. We have an advocate. You go out and break a law, and you get called to court, you either hire an attorney or one is appointed for you, right? That's called your defense attorney, your advocate. Your advocate. There's also a prosecutor. That's not your advocate. That's your accuser. And so we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And what better defense to have than Jesus Christ, the righteous? The one who is right there, equal with the Father, right there in knowledge with God. And he is the propitiation. Propitiation means satisfier or satisfaction. He's the satisfaction for our sins. Not us. We can't work to be saved. Christ satisfied God's wrath on the cross. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Christ died for us. Isn't that wonderful? It's just one thing he's done. He was the redeemer. We read Romans chapter 3 just on Wednesday, talking about the atonement that Christ made, the fact that he bought us back to God, the fact, again, that he satisfied God's wrath. Romans chapter 3 is a great summary, verse 23 through 26, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why do we need to be saved? Because we're sinners. We fail. We fail every day. People fail us. We're not God. We're sinners. We're not righteous. Our hearts are desperately wicked. If you're saved, you, you know that. We say, yeah, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Praise God for that. We're sinners. All have sinned. There's not one that has not and come short of the glory of God. I was just reading where Solomon was praying to God in 1 Kings, and he said almost the exact same thing. There is no one that does not sin. He understood that. You see, we as human beings, we have a pride problem that says, oh, I'm better than other people. I'm better than everyone else. Sarah and I run into it all the time. All the time, people with superiority complexes, people that try to bully and push people around. We run into it all the time. We're all sinners. The ground is level at the foot of the cross, isn't it? We've all failed. We all make mistakes. We all have work to do on ourselves, don't we? But the Bible says, being justified freely by his grace. How? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's not through us, it's through Christ. We can't be good enough. Jesus was the one who was and is good enough. He took care of the price of redemption, which was his blood. The innocent died for the guilty, and thus, thus God was satisfied it says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, remember we looked at this on Wednesday, we talked about the patient, or Sunday, the patience of God, right? Loving us, being patient. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him, how do we become righteous? How are we justified? That's what justification means, to become righteous. We believe in Jesus. Not this haphazard, oh, I believe in Jesus, that people do today. We believe in Jesus. That means we follow him with our whole heart. And so, he's the Redeemer. He made atonement for our sins. We considered also, now this was on Wednesday, Romans chapter 8, if you remember that he intercedes before the throne of God for us. He's our intercessor, Hebrews 7, 25. He's our great high priest. He's, he, he cares that we go through things. He cares. And that's why we must pray, because he cares. 
you probably had things this week you needed to pray for. And I hope you did. I had things this week I needed to pray for. And my wife and I tried to, and we did. Because Jesus cares. We believe what the Bible says, that he takes care of everything. He takes care of everything. You know, I was supposed to go to Pensacola this week and pick Matthew up because he apparently needed a ride. And the night before, Sarah had check engine light. I went and checked it. There's oil all over the place behind the engine underneath. I said, well, no Pensacola for us. And if we would have gone, our engine would have been destroyed in that van because the VTEC valve went bad. You say, well, you had to pay for repairs. Yes, we did, but we didn't have to pay for a new engine. <laughs> And we praise God for that. He took care of it. He takes care of us. You say, you still had to pay money. Yeah, and God will take care of that too. He takes care of us. Thus, we ought to read the word, study it, follow him, right? And part of following is praying. Praying. We looked at that Wednesday again. Revelation 1 and verse 8 says that Christ, not any other part of the Trinity, specifically Christ, he is the Alpha and Omega, right? The beginning, Christ can't be the beginning and the end without being God. He can't be the living word of God without being God made flesh. People try to spin it, don't listen to them. Revelation 1 and verse number 8, Christ saying, I am Alpha and Omega. Alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet. John knew what he was talking about. He's the beginning, he's the start, and he's the finish. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. A statement of eternality. He says, I am the Almighty. I am the Almighty. If Jesus was just a prophet, well, then he's a false one because he claimed to be God. But we know he's so much more than a prophet. He is God made flesh. He is the word. He was with God. And the Bible says he was God. Speaking of one united entity that we know as God. That we call God. Okay. And much of this book itself, book of John, is dedicated to proving that Christ is God. That's where you get many of the proofs because John, motivated and inspired by the Spirit of God, puts forth these things. It says, hey, I, I saw them personally. I experienced this Jesus myself. I know what I'm talking about. Either it's true or it's not. If you're saved, you choose to believe it's true, right? So first, understanding that he, being the word, was God. John 10 and verse number 30, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. I personally, being not a math geek, but a person that likes, doesn't mind math as much as some others, I and the Father are one. He's saying I and the Father are one and the same. People say, well, no he, no, he wasn't claiming that. Okay, well, let's read the context. Let's read the context. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? Then the Jews answered him, saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself. God. That right there puts the critics to silence. The Jews knew what he was talking about. The Jews knew what he was talking about. He is making a claim of deity. And not just here, but you have it in your write-up other places where Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> and the Jews tried to kill him there too. He made claims that God was his father. The Jews knew what he was talking about. They tried to kill him, not just one time in John, but several times. 
several times. He stands up and says, Jesus equals God. You know, my math students, they know that there's three signs for a comparison. There's greater than, less than, and equal to, right? Then there's combinations of all that. But if you're less than God, then you're not God. If you're greater than God, then you're not God. But if you're equal to God, then you are. Zero equals zero. A million equals a million. A million does not equal a million and one or a million point zero zero one. They're not the same. And things that are different are not the same. But when they equal, they are. Jesus equals God. Everything that God is, Jesus is. Everything that, that, that Jesus is, God is. Jesus equals God. And that's a wonderful proof text for you to show folks that would doubt. Now, we can't make people believe the word, but we can believe the word ourselves and we can show people. We can show people what the word says. Jesus Christ and God the Father are one. Before he was ever Jesus, remember, he was the word. He was the word. He only became Jesus. That's his human earthly name. Christ is his title of Messiahship. Jesus is his earthly, there were other Jesuses around the earth at that time, you know. Jesus was his earthly name. It's the name that was given to him. Before this, the understanding is he was the word, the eternal word in heaven. Jesus Christ and God the Father are one. Also, Jesus Christ bears the qualities of, of God just as the Father does. He bears the qualities of God just as the Father does. He is omnipresent, John chapter 3 and verse number 13. This confusing statement that we can only believe by faith that Christ tells Nicodemus and says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is a title for Christ, which is in heaven, Jesus is saying, well, I'm here on earth, but I'm also in heaven. Well, how is that possible? He's God. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. To explain that, can't do it. <laughs> it's beyond our finite minds because I can only be here and you can only be here or there or wherever. We can't be everywhere. But God can be and is. He's omnipresent. He is also omniscient. He knows all things. John 2 and verse 25. The Bible says in verse 24, Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that they should testify of, or any should testify of man for he knew what was in man. In other words, he knows our hearts. He didn't commit himself to the people we referred to on Wednesday that just wanted magic tricks. They just wanted to see the miracles. They didn't want to follow him. They didn't want to do the hard things. They just wanted to go from, oh, wow, look at that trick. Oh, wow, look at that great thing. Now, Jesus didn't commit himself to them because he knew what was in here. He knew they would, most of them, leave him at the drop of a pin, and most of them did, didn't they? John chapter 6 reveals that. It says he knew what was in man. He knows our hearts. He knows our hearts. He knows if you love him or not. He knows if you cling to him or if you're playing games. Just like Peter. We, we had a theme when we studied Peter and God's patience with him the other week. And the theme was, Peter loved Jesus. Did Peter speak out when he shouldn't have? Did Peter uh, do things in the flesh when he shouldn't have? Yes. Yes, he did. But the fact is, Peter loved Jesus. He loved Jesus. And when Jesus tested that, John 21, three times, the third time making Peter's heart grieved, he finally got to the core of the matter and said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. 
And that's where we have to get to. That's where revival happens. Lord, you know what's going on. Lord, you know. You know all things. You know that I love you. He's omniscient. Isn't it wonderful that he knows our heart? He knows our heart. We can mess up and mess up badly. He won't cast us out. We just come back and say, I messed up. Please take me back. He says, I never left you. I never left you. I never cast you away. You just departed for a time. I never left you. It's a wonderful thing. He's omnipotent, meaning he can do all things. He turned water into wine in John chapter 2. There's no way to explain that. You, you can't. You can't spin that beyond Jesus turned water into wine. <laughs> you know, the skeptics, they try to explain the, away God's miracles. And some of them, I, I will admit, God used, and he is within his right to do so. It's his science. He created it all. He can use his earth and the physicalities and whatnot of his earth to do whatever he wants. Or he can just snap his fingers and say, peace be still. And the wind and the waves are calm. Or he doesn't even need to snap his fingers. He just says the word. And the waters turn into wine. The bread is, I don't know how the skeptics can try to explain away the dividing of the uh, bread and the fish to 5,000 people from a little boy's lunch. You can't explain that. You can't explain it. The only explanation is it's God. God. He's omnipotent. He can do anything. Anything he wants to. And it's wonderful that that's the God we serve. That we can trust him. People can say what they want. People can do what they want. Let them. Let them be skeptics. They've got to answer for themselves. Let them be hateful. They've got to answer for themselves. Don't doubt our God. He bears the qualities of God. Then he bears the essence of God. The essence of God is that which, as we say, it's hardwired into him. It's who he is. It's who he is. And so we see Hebrews 4.15, one of these. We see other places. The essence of God within Christ. That's why we say when we, we have a huge movement in the world today, these skeptics and Gnostics and atheists, whatnot. They, they like to try to confuse who God is and make us doubt the goodness of God. We have to drive these things deep in our heart when people say, well, God is mean, God is wrong, God hates people, blah, blah, blah. So, no, the Bible says this. You're just unsaved. You're trying to promote your doubt, your skepticism. The Bible says this, and this is why I believe. I may not understand, and we don't understand everything that's going on, but it doesn't change God's word. Hebrews 4.15, the Bible says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He's holy, he's pure without sin. He made the law, he will not break his own law. He will not offend his own law. He is without sin. That's why Jesus could go to the cross for us. He was a sinless sacrifice. We are not sinless, we are sinful. We had to have our sin forgiven, right? He's loving, Romans 5, 8. God commendeth his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Christ did not come grudgingly, he came willingly. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He, he knew he was coming. Even when Adam and Eve were created, he knew he had to come and die for us. He knew it. He's God. He knows all things. He steps back outside of time and lives in eternity. He's merciful. Matthew 9, 13 speaks of the mercy of God. And isn't it wonderful that God is patient in his mercy? We talked about that with uh, first or Second Peter, where 
He is patient as he's finishing his flock, as he's completing his church. He's patient with the world. He's patient with those. Can you imagine those that would get saved later on in life? He's patient with their blasphemies, with their sinfulness, because he says, oh, I know that person's going to get saved. That's mercy, isn't it? That he doesn't just cast a thunderbolt and strike us down. Matthew 9 and verse number 13 he says, but go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And truly so. He's loving and merciful. He is just. John 55, John 5 and verse 30. He is just. He says, in John 5 and verse 30, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. He is just. God can be nothing but just. Remember, people say God is mean. God's not mean. He's just. If he's ever unjust, we might as well pack it up and go and never come back. If God's ever wrong to you, you say, you, you, you ever felt like God's wrong? Yeah, in my flesh I felt like God's been wrong, and I've been wrong to think that. My perceptions, my understanding's been incorrect. God's never wrong. He's never unjust. If he is, we might as well just toss it all away, right? Just toss it all away. If, if we start thinking, hey, I'm more just than God, I'm better than God, and there's people that do believe that, if not in word and action. They think that they're better uh, parents than God. They think that they're better politicians than God. They think they know better than God, and they show such. They show such. If mankind is ever better than God, we might as well pack it up because we're a bunch of fools. I need to go work for Ace with Phoebe or do something else. The truth is, he is just. He loves us. John 3 and 4, book of James says he is also impartial. We see that in Jesus. He witnessed to the lowly, quote-unquote, Samaritan woman and the high and mighty Pharisee, didn't he? Nicodemus, such contrast. I, I love John 3 and 4. Maybe you do too, between Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman. Such contrast there, but it shows us God loves all people. He cares about their souls. We all too also. He was not just with God. He was God. Verse number three, going back to John 1, we see that the word created all things. The word created all things. We think, well, God made everything. Yes, God, the Father, Son, and Spirit made all things. The word created all things. Going back to John chapter 1, verse number 3. The Bible says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. We don't understand this universe all the scientists have their theories, and this universe is, is so vast. It's, it's beautiful in many ways. And we see here and there some things that the telescopes capture, and other people uh, find with their cameras the planets and the galaxies. And it's just mind-blowing to think that we're just one system in our galaxy, and that each star, to my understanding, I could be wrong, if not each, then many of the stars that are out there have their own systems, their own planets, and we're just one galaxy, and the universe is made up of many galaxies with many stars and their own systems. It's just immense. It's immense. It's, it's so vast. And God made it all. It didn't come about by a big bang it came about by the word of God. You say, well, what did he make? We don't know. And we, we would like to think in eternity we would find out. But I can't say that with any certainty. 
because the Bible doesn't tell us. It would be a nice thought, though. We go from star to star, seeing the wonderful creation of God in eternity. But we'll see. We'll see. Whatever eternity is, we know it's good. It's much better than the alternative, is it not? Christ made it all. We get excited when we fix something, we make something. And rightly so, we have our part in whatever. God made everything and he keeps it all spinning. He keeps it all together. Amazing the things that keep coming out, the, the science that God created, the math that he created. You, you look at, uh, for instance, we looked at the orbits of the planets uh, as they go around the sun. If you look that, you Google it, look it up, you can see it for yourself. And it looks like just a, a spirograph if you ever use those. Just a beautiful mathematic design. It's not chaotic. It's order. God does all things decently and in order. It's consistent. It's beautiful. And Christ, Christ made it. He's the creator. Colossians 1 in verse number 15, talking about the Lord Jesus, it says in verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God. The image of the invisible God. He's all of God that we'll ever see. Because God the Father is a spirit, God the Spirit is a spirit, he's all of God we'll ever see. The image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. He's the firstborn because he's eternal, not because God made him. Firstborn just means he's the first. And is not God the first? Now firstborn has to do also in 1 Corinthians 15 where he talks about the firstborn from the dead, right? He's an example of our resurrection to come, yes? People take these and they spin it and they try to make it seem as if God created Jesus and nothing in the Bible says that. Nothing in the Bible says it. He is just preeminent. God is the first of all things. He was before all things. So he's the firstborn of every creature. Every creature. The angels even, yes? The angels are their own creature. You say, I don't know a lot about them. Yeah, because we aren't meant to. I don't know if there's any other creatures out there. No, we don't know. And by the way, we can't understand things even to a very microscopic level. I mean, you see things under a microscope and it's just amazing. We don't understand all that. That there's whole worlds, whole worlds in your home, microscopic creatures, you know, you say, I don't like to think about that. I don't necessarily either, but it's true. Microscopic creatures have their own place in creation, right? And creatures just a little bigger than them and creatures just until you get all the way up to us. Just craziness, just craziness. There's so much more. We get so self-centered and start to think, oh, it's just us. No, there's so much more. And God made it all. He made it all. It says, for by him, talking about Christ, were all things created. This is another key passage for the doctrine of Christ, by the way. By him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. There's things we can't comprehend. You know, other animals, they can see things into different spectrums. We, can, we have a very limited spectrum of hearing, seeing, and smelling. You know, our cat can smell so much more, just like dogs. They can smell so much more. They can, not our cat, but cats and dogs and other animals, they can hear so much more, right? Now, their eyes, they can't see that things are like grayed out to them. But there are animal butterflies, and other insects and whatnot, they can see into so many other ultraviolet, infrared spectrums, just crazy. Things we can't comprehend. 
visible. And just because we can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? You know, there's people that won't believe in God because they can't see him. Well, you can't see into the ultraviolet spectrum. Does that mean ultraviolet rays don't exist? Certainly they do. We'd say, well, that's foolishness. It's the same logic. You can see, you can't see the ultraviolet rays, but you can sure see the effects of it, <laughs> can't you? You can't see God, but you can sure see the effects of him. Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Now, people like to read into that and say there's different tiers of angels and demons, and there very well may be. But I can't stand here and preach to that because it's not given in detail. We know there's the ultimate power in the universe, and that is God, right? We know that there is a logic, there is order to what he has given in nature, to what he has given in governments, to what he has given in the spiritual realm, no doubt. And that's what it's saying here. God has created the order. Even if he's allowed it, he still allowed it, right? He's the one in control. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. Means he holds it together. You say, well, science says that this does it on its own. Well, if it does, God made it so that it does and doesn't go spinning off into space. We, we saw a rocket launch the other day and we saw how, I don't know if it's the ionosphere or just the, the atmosphere, I didn't look at it in detail, but you know, there, there's a, a thin film that they could see as that rocket's launching into space. There's this thin bronze film covering the earth. I believe that's our atmosphere. Holds all the air in, <laughs> keeps it from going out into the vacuum. You know, space, you can't breathe. It's cold and all that stuff. We have this atmosphere that keeps everything in. And if we were, which is not going to happen, so don't fear this, but if a, a cataclysmic event were to happen, it would wipe the atmosphere away. No air on earth, <laughs> we can't live. It's not going to happen, though. And if it does, we won't be here to see it. God will take care of all that. We have this just thin film. It's just beautiful to look at. You think God created that. God worked that science out. God knows how it all comes together. God gave us the gravity that we have. You know, you're, you're a lot lighter on the moon because gravity is a lot less. You know you're a lot heavier on places like Jupiter because gravity is a lot more. We have what we have. It's perfect for sustaining life. He holds it all together. He created it, and he holds it all together for us. We certainly don't. We're good at destroying things, aren't we? We're very, very good at that. Very bad at holding it all together. The world's proven that time and time again. So by him, all things consist. Don't listen to these unbelievers that say, oh, well, we're going to die because of global warming and climate change. We're going to die if we keep doing X, Y, Z. No, God's going to take care of it. God's going to take care of it. You say, well, earthquakes and hurricanes and volcanoes. Yes, and God's in full control of all that. He knows what the earth needs. He knows what we need. And he is the head of the body, verse number 18 says, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. You see, there it is again. He's the firstborn from the dead for his church. In that all things he might have the preeminence. So what is it to be all about? Christ. What is my job to you? To point you to Jesus. That's my job, and God helping me, that's all I'll ever do. Point you to Christ. If you don't like that, sorry. I'm not changing. 
I'm going to point you to Jesus, point you to the word of God. Because that's what he deserves, the preeminence. He deserves to be first in the church, in our lives, right? We don't ask what will please me. We ask what would please Christ. That's what's given to us as believers. The word created all things. He's the firstborn. He's the source of our creation. And then lastly, this morning, the word is the source of all life and light. You say, explain that. I can't. I can't. But he is. He's the source of all life and light. Why are you saved today? You say, well, because of Christ. Who saved you? It wasn't you. It wasn't me. It wasn't some random book somewhere or creed or denomination or church membership or getting wet in baptism. It was Christ. He gave you life just like he gave me life. We either believe that or we don't. He is the source of all life and light. And so verse number four says, in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shineth in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. So he's the source of life so that we can be saved. This life talking about here is spiritual life. Spiritual life. The creator created life and allows us to be born again. He made the rules for that. He knew what would satisfy him. And so it is. We understand 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10 through 11. Matthew 16 says that Christ is the foundation of our faith. Right? Peter said, Matthew 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. I know I'm summarizing. But nonetheless... Christ is the foundation of our faith, not Peter. God would not build his church upon a sinful man. He wouldn't do it. And it's not for us to build his church. We can't save people, right? We certainly didn't save ourselves. Jesus is upon this rock, the rock that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Upon this rock, I will build my church. That's the very foundation of our faith. When do we find that we slip, we fall, we get in trouble, as it were? It's when we get off the foundation. We get away from the shepherd, as we say, right? It's not because God's failed us. It's not because God's failed us. See, people fail. Institutions fail. I mean, we've seen that the world over. I, I believe there's not one in religious institution today that can be trusted, honestly. Not one. Not one denomination. Not one group. Nope. Don't do it. Because you have the Catholics abusing people. You have... The Baptists abusing people. <laughs> you have everyone abusing someone, it seems like. At least it's coming out of the woodwork and becoming then. That's just one incident. You have religious corruption, doctrinal corruption. You say, who can we trust? Trust in Christ. Go back to the Bible. And don't trust in people. Trust in Christ. That's all we can do. He's the foundation of our faith because people fail us. Institutions fail us. God will never fail us. We're the ones that have to go back to him time and time again and say, Father, I failed you. We never are rightly so. We never rightly accuse him and say, you failed me. Because he surely has not. Revelation 13 and verse 8 says Christ, he's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. We've already alluded to that. 
And 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22 and 45, both say he is the second Adam. He's the source of life so that we can be saved. John chapter 3, verse number 5. Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He's not talking about baptism there. He's talking about a spiritual birth. A physical and a spiritual birth. We need to be born again. And only that can happen through Christ. So he's the source of life. Then lastly this morning, he is the source of light. Like we talk about truth and light, following truth and light. What are we talking about when we speak of that? We're speaking of the written word of God, the living word of God, leading us through the written word of God. Folks, we have to have a foundation, and this is it. You say, I thought you said Jesus was the foundation. He is. He gave us the Bible. I thought you said the Spirit inspired the word. Yeah, the Spirit did inspire the Word, just as with anything else. The Father, Son, and Spirit all have a part in giving us the Word of God. The living Word of God made sure we had the written Word of God. We have to have a handbook we can trust in, or else we're trusting in ourselves, is what it comes down to. And we are not worth trusting in. I am not worth trusting in. You are not worth trusting in. This book is worth trusting in. That's why it's so, so under attack today. That's why Satan wants to get in your heart and in your mind to make you disbelieve it. Through your family members, your friends, your co-workers. Yeah, I know, I, I have illustrations for all that. My family members, too. Right? My friends, too. And that's why we have to guard ourselves and take this book seriously. So people refuse to today. People refuse to. Christ is the source of light so that we can know him. The light spoken of here is a witness of the word being God, creator, and savior. We understand that some light also beyond this book, we have the witnesses of creation, conscience, Right? The natural witnesses, if you will, the things we we're born with. Even if we didn't have the word of God, we have our conscience that knows, hey, I killed that person. I shouldn't do that. Hey, I stole that thing. I shouldn't do that. Hey, I, 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 I uh, coveted something. I shouldn't do that because our heart pangs us, hurts us. We have that conscience that God gives us. Yes, Romans chapter 2 and verse 14 through 15 speaks. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. We have creation. It's people that repress those natural pieces of light that were given through their selfish, self-centered flesh. They say, oh, well, I, uh, there, there, there can't be uh, a creator. It mu it, it's all on us. It can't be a creator. It must be of chance. Uh, foolishness. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Right? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. People repress it within themselves. We're given creation. You look at creation, the order of it, the beauty of it. You look at it too long, you can't help but know that there's intelligent design there. It didn't happen by chance. Things don't happen by chance. Man tries to prove it does, but he can't. Animals can't evolve a certain way beyond a certain point and it make any sense. Scientists know that. They just ignore it because they want to promote themselves. We have a conscience. People repress their conscience so much so that many have seared their conscience. They become deadened, right? And so they ignore God. And we talked about we have God's word. We have God's word. And there were prophets and preachers that have been sent throughout history that have promoted God's word. Witnesses. And we're to be witnesses also. 
Every person is given some light. How much of it will you follow? If you're saved, will you keep following it? Don't become like Lot and say, hey, I got enough of Jesus. I don't, I'm just going to go do my own thing. That's the worst thing you can ever do. Keep following that light. And as verse 5 says, despite the light that is given, mankind has regularly, regularly rejected it. The light shineth in darkness, the darkness comprehended it not. Folks, we have family members that do this, friends, co-workers, people we love, people we don't even know, too. We can't live a deluded life to save ourselves some grief. We need to understand people are dying and going to hell. They're rejecting the light that they're given, and we need to pray that they be saved. We need to pray that they be saved. We need to determine to be a good testimony before them. Because folks, while they're rejecting the light, there's nothing within them that can grasp it without God's help. Remember, you didn't save yourself. Maybe you were like me. You heard the gospel plenty of times before you actually got saved, as we say. Why didn't you get saved there's plenty of times before because God didn't give you faith and understanding. And so we need to pray that God would give that to folks. Stop railing on the world and saying, oh, the world's doing terrible things. Yes, they are, but it's not our job to fix it. It's God's job. It's our job to pray and to be that good testimony. It's what we tell the kids, Phoebe and Sarah and Jimmy, they go to work. They are Pinecrest Baptist Church at work, right? You say, oh, no one will get saved because, no, you don't know that. We've had opportunities just this week to try to be a blessing to people. You don't know. You don't know. And we ought to care because this world is lost and they need the Lord. Christ is the word. He's the creator God. He's the life. He is the light. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17. We'll finish with that. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17. The Bible says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. You think if people um, could be saved through baptism, Christ would have sent Paul to baptize. No, <laughs> he sent him to preach the gospel, not, the wisdom, not with wisdom of words. Your winsomeness and mine is not going to save people. Trying to become like Joel Osteen, trying to become like Joyce Meyer is not going to save people. It's the gospel that has to speak to their hearts. It says, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Even if we could con someone to be saved and say, Jimmy, all you got to do is, you want to go to heaven, don't you? All you got to do is pray this and then get baptized. And, yeah, you're fine. I just destroyed the gospel, didn't I? That's how it grew up, basically. Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. You give the gospel, what should you focus on? Christ, <laughs> Jesus. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? You know, there's people think that they're so smart. They think they're smarter than God. Because the Bible says things and they say, oh, well, no, I know it to be different. They think they're smarter than God. God says, where are those people? 
Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. See, the smarter the world gets, the more they draw away from him. Because they're just focused on themselves. It says, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. And he still is to this day. And unto the Greeks foolishness. And people see us as fools. Yes, to this day. Are you willing to be a fool for Christ? But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ this is, if you're saved, this is who Jesus is to you. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Father, I pray you take these things this morning, that you would help us to focus on Christ this Christmas, to once again come to him and see him as the word, as the light of the world. We thank you for sending him to save us. Pray you'd speak to us now if you've not already. Draw us as only you can. Give us understanding as only you can. Those that we love so much that need you, we pray you give understanding, repentance, humility. Draw these to you. May we rejoice when folks see themselves for what they are, see Christ for who he is, and trust in him. Be a wonderful Christmas. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, let's stand. Sarah's going to come play. What's God speaking to you about? Is it drawing closer to Christ? Is it that family member, that friend, that co-worker that needs Christ? What is it? Whatever it is, say yes to God today. Say yes to him. You'll never regret it. With heads bowed and eyes closed, let's stand. Sarah's going to play. Talk to the Lord. Take this time. We're in no rush.
Father, we thank you for this time. We pray to help us as Christmas season rolls along, help us to be a light to others. And we so pray for those that need the light. We pray you'd work on their hearts, that they would turn to you. We'll thank you for it. We'll give you the glory and make us so, so happy. So, so happy. I just pray you'd work. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to 138, if you would, please. 138 is go tell it on the mountain. We sing the chorus, the first verse, and then the chorus again. 138. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is Lord. Shepherds kept their watching or silent flocks by night. Behold, throughout the heavens there showed a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is Lord. God bless you for being here this morning. We trust you have a good week. We'll see you Wednesday, 7 o'clock as usual. And we'll continue this study on John 1. If you need anything, please reach out to us. Let us know. We'll be praying for you. And see you then. God bless you.